you know, I really think that uh, speaking from this side, you know, we got colored because it's easy to measure these things. Absolutely. I was, you know, I was able to add a kilo of progress, right? I was able to take one second off, live by the clock, die by the clock. It doesn't matter how I did it. As long as I went faster, it was great. And so it was easy to appreciate, understand. And that probably came from our need to quantify through sports science. It's an, also an artifact of sports science, right? Like the gold standard was, you know, on a bike, testing your VO2 max. You're like, really? You know, if you, you know that, that is not the same thing as any other sport or any other thing. So there's some place where it is, we need, we need to quantify movement skills right? And you, you have started that conversation and people like you now are realizing, okay, what are our foundations? What are the cores? And what you'll see is, okay, that principle now is the, the basis of being able to do a pistol or a rolling pistol or lower myself from a box or jump and land or, you know, some of the, some of the, so you'll, we'll see that overlap, but to the point of, you know, do we, do we just chase physiology and does that beget all issues? Because let's just take a step back for a second. We've been training the core for, I don't know, 10 years, 20 years, right? Mm -hmm. We have been going, however long we've been chasing the core, um, we have been um, going to the gym. We have been doing fitness-like things. How's low back pain? Through the roof. How's diabetes? Through the roof. How is fall risk in the elderly? Through the roof. How is, I mean, choose some metric and let's give ourselves a grade. And I'm going to say, and I'm not going to say move, natural move, I'm going to say, formal, like commercial ventures of fitness. Let's just say how we're doing. Well, it turns out gym memberships and obesity track perfectly in America, right? As the BC rates go up, so do the gym membership. So what I can unequivocally say is as a, as a scientist is we met a hypothesis and now it doesn't seem to be working very well right? Yeah. You know, inputs and outputs. How are we doing? Let's give ourselves a grade. Are we moving well? Well, our kids are a mile, a minute slower on the mile. Their trunks are weaker. ACL injury rates are through the roof on boys and girls. It's like an epidemic. So let me just tell you how it's going. It's not working. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's my central argument behind Evolve New Play, right? We have, uh, we're missing core nourishments and we're failing to understand what motivates people to move. If you're not helping people move in a way that taps That's right. these states and gets them into flow, they're not going to they're not going to be retained oh. over time. Welcome to the Evolve Move Play podcast, where we bring you the most interesting and enlightening conversations around movement practice and how you can become the most heroic version of yourself through pursuing movement that's relevant to your nature. This is a podcast that's going to feature some of the top movers in the world, some of the most amazing movement thinkers, and people from fields that are related to movement as far afield as evolutionary theory, strength and conditioning, and everything in between. So if you're interested in movement, Please stick around, and if you like our work and want to support it, please consider supporting us on Patreon because this podcast is completely listener-supported. We don't want to take any advertising. We don't want to interrupt your experience of watching the show. So what really helps us get the best thinkers on, have the time to put these together, have the best quality for you guys as far as audio and video is your support. So please consider supporting us and enjoy the rest of the show. Hello, and welcome back to the Evolve Move Play podcast. Today is our 50th episode. We started back in 2016 with Kelly Sturette and Juliet Sturette as our first guests. Kelly's back with us today for our 50th episode. We also interviewed him last week. We wanted to continue the conversation because we got cut short, and this became another great one. Um, it's always good to catch up with Kelly, and this was just a really fun and enjoyable conversation. In the last episode, he talked about um, you know, how he maybe hadn't respected and taken enough attention to natural movement and parkour. And so that becomes the starting grounds for this conversation, which goes deep into play and how we deal with kids and how we physically educate people um, and, and how all this comes together. So it's a really interesting conversation. I think you guys will enjoy it. Um, since it's our 50th, I would just uh, say, if you want to support us, check us out on Patreon, you know, um, help us keep this going during coronavirus, during everything that's going on. Also, um, we do have our online natural parkour course available again. We're really excited. We've got a lot of people coming in, uh, getting involved, getting moving. This is something that you can do um, without access to a gym. 
and we're really excited about the community that's growing around it. So if you are looking for something to do, if you want to keep your body moving, if you want to get out in nature, uh, this is a great time to get started. So uh, that's all I'll say. Without further ado, Kelly Sturet. So as we were finishing our conversation last week, you were talking about how you, when we first met, you could have gone deeper into natural movement and parkour. And I was really intrigued by uh, you saying that. And I was curious if you could expand a little bit more on, on how you're thinking about that and, and what that looks like for you going forward. Well, what's interesting is that you cannot deny uh, play, movement, freedom. I grew up in the mountains. Mm -hmm. I grew up climbing and scrambling and clutterstying and jumping. And we had, you know, I think it's you who told me one time, or it was uh, someone who basically did an informal study that kids who could do pull-ups grew up with a tree in their backyard, right? That yeah. sounds familiar. That's me, yeah. Well, it turns out I climbed these pine trees that were like 100 feet tall in mm -hmm. Germany. We had these trees, and it was impossible to fall to your death because yep. of the way the branches were, right? And you could just climb and climb. There's no exposure. Mm -hmm. All we did was climb. And we would see, like, we'd climb these epic trees. So part of i think what i understood was i came out of a tradition where we skied we biked we climbed we played we paddled and i still got injured right mm -hmm. and i and that wasn't enough to protect me from or ha act as a diagnostic tool to understand what my movement restrictions were or my incomplete patterning because you know if we just say it's all natural it's all just a novel movement solution. Well, I, heel, I was a heel striker for years. Mm -hmm. And I even ran cross country as a heel striker. And then when my knees blew up, you know, just keep running more. Well, it turned out there was some technique underneath there. And at the time, clearly, I wasn't in an environment that was constrained enough to force certain adaptations, which is not, it's not an, an error of natural movement or, or functional movement play, whatever we're going to call it. It was an error that the, the, I wasn't punished, and I put that in quotation marks, by moving poorly, right? I could move poorly enough in this play environment. So what I had come to understand too also was that there was a huge gap between the way we were training and preparing athletes. So if you're going to go to the Olympics, you're not jumping from log to log and swinging and brachiating and doing capoeira. That may be, that may be your movement tradition, but that is not what sports looks like. And so I had this real sort of gap in my understanding because I didn't think I, that was creating just as much dysfunction, really big, strong people who that we just burned out in very short order. Yeah. So I think initially I really needed to come to understand sort of the classic gymnastics approach to movement. Like, what is it? Where's the, where's the Venn diagram overlap between being a physical therapist and what we were learning as a correlate low level like rehab language that didn't wasn't natural movement based or classic strength and conditioning based and i needed to sort of back into understanding what it was that we were doing in that language as a diagnostic tool and once i understood that then i, I think my worldview could open up a little bit around and and i around approving or approaching natural movement right besides go play more and and really having a chance to drop into the formality of it you know, whether you go Fighting Monkey or you're Ido Portal or you're Rafe Kelly, you know, there is a whole lot of amazing content. But we have also, I'm sure we're out of Irwan, of course, we also have to appreciate that in the 15 years since we, I really started, or 16 years or 17 years, natural movement has become a lot more organized, right? It's not just what are we feeling, because that's a movement practice and play. And one of the things that I think really resonated about your work and that we're thinking is that you're like, here's building block A, here's building block B, here's how these links, these skills link together, here's how they transfer. Because what it was always lacking was, or what we always believed, as I said before, was the best athlete is the one who could pick up the new skill the fastest. Well, why is that? What was it about that, right? And what I saw was, um, you know, gymnasts could pick up new skills fast, but, you know, if I took potentially natural movers and threw them in a, in a different environment it didn't necessarily automatically beget better functional output comma because 15 years ago it was highly 
regionalized, tribalized, people who had an identity. I'm move mat, I'm CrossFit, I'm an Olympic lifter, I'm a power lifter, I'm a strong man. You know, Nick's, we should never meet in the middle. And now we're just more evolved. So I really can appreciate that. And also I have kids now. And, and the question begets, like, if I'm trying to create these great athletes, and, and when I, that, I mean, someone who can go into the environment their whole lives and play and be prepared, does that look like just kettlebell swings and push presses? Mm, maybe missing some things there, right? So that's really where I think we have to, I have come to understand and appreciate this language i mean i'm sitting here sitting on the ground talking to you you know like you know so again you know in my evolution you know i used to be a lot more severe as we talked about earlier and i'm less severe and i also really appreciate that people live in cities people don't go outside they don't have time to go outside and play they're not going to jump around it doesn't feel good that's not even a good conversation or it can be a difficult conversation to initiate with someone who's never moved, much less exercise. Not that I think soul cycle is the answer, don't get me wrong. But you know, what I what we trip on is wow, where do we put this in? You know, because if you come to one of my classes, you know, warm-ups look and smell and feel a lot like movement play, right? Because that's that's the really a good way to get prepped. You know, I just picked up David Weck's jump ropes mm -hmm. and I'm trying to figure out how do I add more rotation into my diet? You know, how do I how do, what's a different way I can warm up than the way I've been warming up for 25 years, you know? So how do I keep adding skills to this thing so that I become a more interesting turned on mover? So I think that's, that's the long answer to your, to your question, right? Yeah, that, that's really great. Uh, so a couple things that came up to me, um, there, there's so much to dig on there, but you said Olympic athletes don't prepare this way, right? Um, but they did in the past, right? I don't know if you've seen this beautiful YouTube video of, I think it's the Polish wrestling team from the 1960s. And they've got these Polish wrestlers doing acrobatics, doing barbell lifts, right? But they're also running through the woods, jumping over creeks, running up hills, vaulting over things in the snow, right? They're picking up huge logs and tossing them over their head. So, you know, and one of the things that I've thought about a lot is, the pedagogies that we develop, they'll exist within the ecology of how we move, right? That's right. So if you, if you take some kids who naturally, who roughhoused every day, ran around in the woods every day and, uh, you know, and played tons of games and tons of sports and flipped off cliffs and stuff, and you, and you put them in a formal training environment and you want to create some adaptions real quickly, they're going to allow them to be a, an athlete. More of what they're already doing isn't necessarily going to take them over the edge something powerful and targeted like a barbell is going to be great, right? I think about this in re reference to martial arts. It's like a, maybe a traditional formal education in how to punch is useful for someone who can map it to having punched somebody in the past, right? But you take a bunch of kids who've never been allowed to be physical together and the likelihood that they're going to take your shadow boxing drill and be able to get good perception action coupling to be able to fight somebody without ever physically touching another person is zero. Yeah. And so I think, I think I agree with that. You know, the, the, we, used, we used to play a game, you know, that had a really inappropriate name, but say basically someone would pick up a shirt and then everyone else would try to tackle that person, right? Splat the brat. Splat the brat. And what we did was it was 100% participation. Everyone could play. No one got hurt. And if you were worried about getting tackled, you dropped the bait. You know, you, you know, but what ended up happening was all self-limiting, very fit kids picked it up and ran a lot. You learned how to fall. You learned how to tackle. You learned how to do what you needed to do. And, you know, I agree with that. And then what I just don't want to say is, you know, should kids be in these formal movement? There should be play. Like I've been saying for years, I'm like, does your kid have an aerobic sport? Right. I mean, are they exposing their lungs once in a while? You can do that any way you want. I don't care, right? But are they breathing hard? Because what we found is that the kids who grew up breathing hard are hard to catch later on. Cross-country skiing, running, playing, swimming, soccer, name, name your sprint. I don't care how you do it. Are your kids breathing hard? Yes or no. Do they have a sliding sport? And that, and that is, are they skateboarding? Do they bike? Do they mountain bike? Do they ski? Do they snowboard? Do they surf? Do they scurf? Like being able to 
take that input, make real life decisions, process, plan for what's going on, right? Do they have a hand-eye coordination sport where they can really understand what's going on, catch a ball, make, make that complex? And all of a sudden, you start to see that you're really creating this, this movement environment. I would love some formal ballet, some fighting, some gymnastics piece in there too. And all of a sudden, really like, like you say, there's so much richness in there. The pathways have been set. And then when you're ready to plug them in, you can plug in a pathway. Yeah. But the problem is the next conversation, fair, you know, just more of everything doesn't beget better technique, right? It ends up being sort of the, sort of the superficial idea of circus school. We have incredible circus schools here. They're highly technical. It's not just willy nilly expression. I'm on the so dude, it's so technical. At some point, there's a conversation about technical ability that has to happen, shoulder position, movement, right? There is not a, a just play more, play more, play more. Otherwise, you know, we wouldn't teach any skills anywhere, anytime. You know, so, yes. So the idea here is we, you know, there is some threshold where we say, okay, here's as ready as you need to be or as ready as you can be given your environment then we can layer on some formality. The problem is today, we don't have any of that environmental background play richness. In fact, it is like, like if we put that as a vitamin, we all have rickets, yes. scurvy, right? All of the things that you have, those, and we're having to teach everything now without any exploration, without any fun. You know, Greg Glassman made this example a long time ago. He's like, look, we wanted to learn how to unicycle. One of us bought a unicycle. We held on. I went, you went, I went, you went. We just played and played. Someone discover something, teach it. The number of falls and hours of deep learning that went on there, insane. Now you're like, mm, I belong to three uni unicycle Facebook groups. I've downloaded the unicycle app. I have a, I have a unicycle sensor. I, I haven't even unicycled yet. And I'm so far removed. And yet my ability to learn, pick up a new unicycle skill in that second case is faster. I pick up new skills more quickly. I become, but I don't learn and I'm not good at not falling. I'm just good at learning the skill really quickly. So there's got to be a, a, a foundational back and forth play around some of that stuff. Right. I agree that there is a, there is a, you know, this is this is the conversation that we had the last time, right? This is the the core conversation that we need to have in kind of physical culture. Is there's some big missing pieces that come out of play mm. and natural movement. Mm. And there's also dance, the fighting, yeah, movement solutions. But there's also the reality that 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 there are tools that come out of the formal background that allow us to attain skills and powers that. That, that are not the norm for human beings, right? And also, there's the reality that, that when you're, you know, how you would develop as a natural human in a natural environment, you can't simply try to replicate that an hour, three times a week and expect to have the same. Mm. Because yeah, I, I really, that's mm -hmm. elegantly stated and 100% true, right? Because I think we... And I'm just going to say we, because I am a skateboarder, like, you know, hooligan who has a slack line in his yard, you know, in between deadlift sets today, I'm on my slack line as much as I can. And then climbing the, you know, the monkey bars, um, you know, I really think that uh, speaking from this side, you know, we got colored because it's easy to measure these things. Absolutely. I was, you know, I was able to add a kilo progress right i was able to take one second off live by the clock die by the clock doesn't matter how i did it as long as i went faster it was great and so it was easy to appreciate and understand and that probably came from our need to quantify through sports science it's an art, also an artifact of sports science right like the gold standard was you know on a bike testing your vo2 max you're like really you know if you you know that that is not the same thing as any other sport or any other thing so there's some place where it is, we need, we need to quantify movement skills, right? And you, you have started that conversation and people like you now are realizing, okay, what are our foundations? What are the cores? And what you'll see is, okay, that principle now is the, the basis of 
being able to do a pistol or a rolling pistol or lower myself from a box or jump and land or, you know, some of these, some of the, so you'll, we'll see that overlap, but to the point of, you know, do we, do we just chase physiology and does that beget all issues? Because let's just take a step back for a second. We've been training the core for, I don't know, 10 years, 20 years, mm -hmm. right? We have been going, however long we've been chasing the core, um, we have been um, going to the gym. We have been doing fitness-like things. How's low back pain? Through the roof. How's diabetes? Through the roof. How is fall risk in the elderly? Through the roof. How is, I mean, choose some metric and let's give ourselves a grade. And I'm going to say, and I'm not going to say moot natural movement. I'm going to say formal, like commercial ventures of fitness. Let's just say how we're doing. Well, it turns out gym memberships and obesity track perfectly in America, right? As the BC rates go up, so do the gym membership. So what I can unequivocally say is as a, as a scientist is we met a hypothesis and now it doesn't seem to be working very well, right? Yeah. You know, inputs and outputs. How are we doing? Let's give ourselves a grade. Are we moving well? Well, our kids are a mile, a minute slower on the mile. Their trunks are weaker. ACL injury rates are through the roof on boys and girls. It's like an epidemic. So let me just tell you how it's going. It's not working. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's my central argument behind Evolve New Play, right? We have, uh, we're missing core nourishments and we're failing to understand what motivates people to move. If you're not helping people move in a way that taps that's right. play states and gets them into flow, they're not going to, they're not going to be retained. Oh. For time. So, so yeah, so we need this conversation and, and it is, it isn't, you know, I, I think one thing that comes up for you is this, like, oh, so we just put people out in the woods and they play. There, there has to be something more than that. And there is, right? And I agree. But I want to make the argument that, that there's maybe more there uh, than you realize, too. And my argument for this comes from observing the park. Oh, no, no, no. Don't pen me. Don't you dare say that I realize. I, <laughs> I'm aware, okay. right? I get, I get it. Okay. Comma, then let's just say, then is appreciated because I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. So, so I, okay. So I, I just want to make this, I, I've made this argument a few times here and I don't know if you've heard me make it, but, but what I've noticed over the years. So if you look at the development of the parkour community um, and you know, um, essentially in 20 years, you see parkour athletes go from a handful of people in the world who look like total amateurs to a, a large cohort of athletes who are, competitive as athletes with any elite athletes in any sport right so oh yeah the you know i have friends who do triple backflips off of bars outside and uh double twisting double uh flips right these are skills that onto are, another bar <laughs> maybe not onto another bar um, my, buddy, <laughs> my buddy nate weston does side flip precisions onto bars so he's done a side flip precision bounce back to double backflip so these are skills that would be rated at the top you know, they'd be rated E skills on a scale that goes up to D, but where almost nobody competes at D in gymnastics, right? Um, on the, and then if you look at just pure jumping power, right? There are parkour athletes now who, are, I don't have great data on this, but I'm fairly certain the best parkour athletes are now doing 20 foot running jumps, running broad jumps. And if you account for the fact that they have to land on a hard surface and that they are only doing, you know, maybe a, a nine step run up at most, that's probably 90% of what you're seeing from elite uh, uh, long jumpers, right? So, mm, how about 80%? But 80%. it doesn't matter. It's, <laughs> it's in concrete. In it's, you, gotta, you can't just bail into the sand and lay there. Exactly. That's my point, exactly. right? Yeah, yeah. Accounting for these factors, right? So, you know, I watched a video of Mitchell Watt. Mitchell Watt from a 10-step run-up did a 25-foot long jump. That's extraordinary. He's landing in a pit. Right. If, if, if a parkour athlete goes 20 feet and lands from the same run up on a hard surface, I don't know what it would take to get Mitchell Watt to do the same jump. Right. And you take that parkour athlete, he's not going to hit that 25 foot jump either. He's going to be 22 no. in the pit. No, he's not specialized. He's, he's general. But my point is that, that when you cross compare them, they're at a very high level now. Hey, we're back. Sorry. You broke up there for a long time. We started with, um, you're responding to, well, just the idea is that like what we're seeing is hyper specialization again in the community, right? Where the elite athletes go up and that's no different than CrossFit or Olympic lifting or 
BMX yeah. or right. So the, the real, the real question is like, you know, if those we're seeing great athleticism expressed across any domain, I'll, I'll take my first pick will not be the gymnast. It will be the parkour athlete. My first pick will not be the long jumper. It will be the parkour athlete. Like parkour tag is something I watch obsessively. <laughs> so it is, it is the greatest game there is. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, man, now you, now you're really getting me excited. Um, <laughs> so, so, so I wrote this article I'll, I'll share with you. I'd love to have your feedback on it called, you know, aliveness and the universal human athletic blueprint. But the basic argument is that when we expose ourselves to a broad set of constraints, we attune the nervous system to being better at solving problems in general. And there's a specific set of constraints that are highly relevant, which is basically, can you move through your environment well, right? Can you move an object around well? And can you move with another person well? So you have to have something like parkour, something like a team sport, uh, hand-eye coordination, ball sport activity, and you have to have opponent processing, wrestling, grappling. These are the- I agree with that. I really agree with that. Um, so, so the, the reason that I brought up the parkour example, though, is not that, okay, all these people have done it. What's interesting to me about the parkour athletes is they did it without support, right? If a parkour athlete is doing a triple backflip and a gymnast is doing a triple backflip, the gymnast started when he was six and he's had a coach with him the entire time. He's been training 40 hours a week. And the parkour athlete has been training 10 hours a week since he was 13 and he's doing it on concrete. Like that says something really interesting about the ability of of learners to self-organize which isn't to say that that only through the self-organization process are we going to to optimize it but it it says something that i think is pretty profound like we have to look into how are these athletes and we talked about movement right what does the movement quality of these athletes look like you came to my gym and you saw people with collapsed arches and knees and true you'll see athletes like that and even 10 years ago a lot of the best parkour athletes still had janky as hell looking movement. But if you look at most of the best parkour athletes now, you see like a universal, beautiful archetypal squat pattern every time they land. They have to. The, the environment is set up to punish that poor movement and to punish ineffective technique. You know, I don't know if I would buy into the hypothesis that um, parkour is better at organizing the brain or some aspect of development because the gymnast does it with more practice. I would say that the hyper replicable technical nature of the demands of what the gymnasts do require that, mm -hmm. but it's notable to the point of, you know, I don't think you'd see Simone Biles unless Simone Biles was Simone Biles in that gymnastic environment. Right. But I think it is notable that when you, are going to crash and burn you make decisions that are very different and you know Stephen Collar calls it transient hypo you know frontality right which is you know your brain gets into flow state and you are learning quickly because it's play and because you are going to fucking die <laughs> you know you are going like you will make very different decisions or you will short circuit your decision making until the skill is dialed right if you're jumping into a foam pit, it's very different than making that first leap from bar to bar when you have something at risk and at stake. And so, it, you know, I, I bet that if we you know, got in there, what we'll see is the environment really does drive adaptation. And this is why coaching matters and, you know, being in a tribe matters and, you know, some of the best athletes in the world. I mean, if we just took, you know, one example, um, CrossFitters, right? Uh, it's not an accident that Matt Frazier, um, you know, uh, Rich Froning, Tia Claire Toomey, Dan, they all live in the same place. They've mm -hmm. all gathered because they, they realize that they can, you know, draft, slingshot, work together, get better in that, in that little community. And you'll start to see that where the environmental constraint, the, the support, right, allows for those quantum leaps ahead, you know. If looking at when the VHS happened, you know, the fact that we can record things, understand it, re replicate it, you know, I mean, you know, what they say, what was the, uh, the snowboarding move? You only land once the YOLO remember how crazy that was. And now you're like, Oh yeah, you did a little YOLO, whatever, yeah. you know? And um, so I think one is that it begets uh, 
we also need to finish the conversation. What do my parkour athletes look like in five years and 10 years, right? That's something we don't know yet. So for me, what, one of the conversations, and, and I'll apply that to Olympic lifting and to cross-sitting and to cyclists and everywhere else, you need to come out unharmed if we're saying that this is a sustainable practice at one rep or at a million reps, right? And it's not an accident. You're seeing movement all come back towards the efficiency because that's how you get more reps in. That's how you, you know, sustain. In fact, I would say the jumping and landing mechanics for our parkour athletes are better than the jumping and landing mechanics for our Olympic lifters because all you have to do is Olympic lift. You don't have to go anywhere else. You don't have to transfer the skill. You don't have to run forward. You just have to go up and down with your body, right? So you can actually get away with crap that you cannot get away with in parkour. Right. I mean, those guys are running in jeans for crying out loud. Right. So, yeah. you know, the, the, the point is, you know, under one is if we take all these things, just shake them up. When do we begin this conversation with our kids Two, you know, the two sports, my, my daughter does some training with me, some formal weight training. This is my 15 year old. Now she does a little bit of running. She hates biking. She loves to ski. She trains kick tie kickboxing and water polo. And I'm like, all right, that's good. Pretty good. You're, you know, mm-hmm. rinse, wash, repeat for the rest of your life, you know? And, um, you know, I have tricked her and manipulated into those things and planted traps for her, but I don't care if she's an athlete, if she's an athlete she'll, or wants to compete as an athlete, this is not what that's about at all. This is about, you know, do are you competent to swim and run and jump i mean the foundations of track are jumping running and throwing you know exactly what you said and theoretically it would be nice to interact with another human but even track and it's you know very formal we run straight we don't have to cut you know there's a great example uh where people are like oh yeah the, the nfl athletes are faster than the than the, the sprinters. I'm like, well, did you see Usain Bolt just break the all time speed record in like he without warming up? Hurt. You know, he just was like, like in his sweats and his fashion pumas and he's like, Pink, right? So I'm like, okay, but he does not have the ability to cut and land and take a load and roll and swing and catch and prepare and listen to someone else. So who's the better athlete? I'll take the rugby player over the uh over the yeah. olympic track sprinter. what do you what do you if you don't know what the task is tyreek evans is a better runner right he can adapt to more situations which is where i'm really interested in this idea of, of perception action coupling how do we do more training that feeds the nervous system solving problems so yes. that it gets better at solving problems across things so one of the reasons why i think yeah and and the problem isn't Oh, now it's heavier. (laughs) Okay. That's one problem, you know? And I, I want to say that, you know, one of the things that I appreciate, I'm like, look, do you have the skill? Great. Can you do the skill when your heart rate's high? Hmm, You can't. Okay. So the skills integrated. Can you do the skill when you have to go fast? Oh, fucked up again. Missing that. Oh, can you do the skill when you have to uh, change directions up? You know, can you do the skill when you have to compete against someone else? Can you do the skill if you have to do a different skill before? Like suddenly you're seeing that, you know, the way we have traditionally said skill, starts to smell like sport and competition and fighting and the physiologists get in right how fit do i need to be in my environment i mean yesterday i was just making a joke with our neighbors and i was like they're like what are you doing i was like about to lift some weights because my what my life is artificially so soft (laughs) that i have to do this fake work right to support these muscles that i don't need in my fake life like, you know, I'm like, it's really crazy. And then I'm eating to support these, you know, at some point we, we, we haven't done a good job of saying what are minimums, right? And also, what is it you like to do? You know, if you like to lift weights, I'm like, knock yourself out, kid. But don't tell me you're going to be the person I don't be bummed out when I don't choose you for my snowboard team, mm-hmm. you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and to this point, I want to point out, they were a couple of years ago, you know, they added big women's big jump. Yeah. Thing, right. The big air. Yeah. Um, it wasn't just the single that, but they added on skiing and they almost canceled it because like eight out of 12 of the top women had suffered ACL injuries and lower leg injuries, you know, in the season prior, they almost didn't have enough field to do this sport, which tells me there are some classic deficits in this environmental training besides huck more, huck more, solve problems in the wild. Like what you're seeing is we're exceeding our capacities. 
which means to your to this great point you're making what are our minimums so what we haven't done is said hey i see you're trying this new parkour skill but you're landing and you seen your knee and foot bro you're not strong enough to stick that skill in. okay then we could we could minister to that we could remediate that we could attenuate those like first of all can we all identify when someone isn't moving in a better way and then also not romanticize and saying oh it's just a novel solution you're just a unique snowflake moving in the world and i'm like that's some horse shit i'll see you on the operating room because you're going to get injured right well we have we have to recognize that there athletes solve problems they solve problems with the resources that they have that's right it doesn't mean that the solution that they have is optimal to if they had better resources I've been working on a skill recently, uh, the corkscrew, right? <laughs> it's actually funny. I was listening to your, um, your interview with George St. Pierre and they're like, uh, Kelly's probably the only 230 pound man who can do a, a, a backflip. And I was like, no, 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 no. I'm doing backflips with full twists. <laughs> but, uh, I was 230 then I'm down to, down to 215 now, but, uh, but yeah, so I'm working on this full twisting backflip off one leg. And the reality is that my chronic history of ankle injuries is a huge limiter in this skill because if I have to land a little bit awkwardly, I don't have the ability to buffer or I haven't had the ability to buffer that. So my progression through the skill has been really limited by, by a lack of formal fixing of the ankles, right? And no amount of playing with the skill you know, no amount of perfect perception action coupling is going to take away that fundamental limitation. And I could, I could learn the skill by routing around it and find a solution. But as I go up that chain of, of here's the next skill at the next skill, I'm going to keep hitting that hurdle. That hurdle is going to keep slowing me down. And I, I will say that that is not endemic to freestyle athletes, for lack of a better word, or natural movers. Yeah. You know, that is typical of, um, every athletic especially in the formal movement training sessions right because one of the things we talk about all the time is does does your position transfer does this shape open up doors or is it just a dead end movement solution one time get out of jail free card yes you landed in that but now you can't jump you can't change directions you've actually given yourself fewer movement choices movement options and this pattern interference for me is one of the things that kills me right because theoretically if you and i go move through the environment I go back and I've reinforced all of the shapes, all of the things that I feel and can translate that to a novel environment. That is really the hallmark of some of the things we're talking about. And it's not an accident. I mean, if you can jump and land and you have to stick your landing butt to ankle, you're probably going to be able to stick that landing butt to ankle in a, you know, in an Olympic lift, right? So, because you have those positions and you know what it's like to absorb force. I mean, the Russians used to have kids jump off ladders. That's one of the old Russian laws, right? And people are like, what was that about? I was like, well, they could quickly see if you had your crap together enough to land that, that from that height, right? They could see everything they needed to see about whether you could progress to the next skill. Mm -hmm. And that is the game, right? Yeah. yeah. So we, um, so yeah, so to finish my story there, um, I picked up a skill called uh, the Peterson or the Patrick step up, right? Um, ben Patrick, uh, Athletic Truths Group, you may have been familiar with him, but it's freaking great because it forces me to get into dorsiflexion and opens up my ankle and it's highly specific and it's, it's not play and it's not fun, um, but it is necessary. We need a balance. But my thing is that when we talk about GPP in general, we've ignored this perception action coupling aspect of it. Yes, 100%. And when we, and when we're thinking about somebody who is trying to be a good mover, who doesn't have a specific sport that they're outputting towards, if we only give them the physiological stuff, we're doing them a disservice. Oh no! Not only disservice, we're crippling them. Yeah. And what we're done is we was like, you're prepared. You went to Soul Cycle and you swung a kettlebell and you did a bunch of burpees. Go crush yourself. Yeah. You know, and I think I'm like, ooh, you know, like, ooh, like, what part of that do I own? One of the things I walk into a room for, you know, I walk into a room with coaches all the time and I say, how many of you coach someone for 10 years? You know what their athletic development, and that's only 10 years. I mean, but have you coached a single person through a lifespan of 10 years? Because I have some athletes now I've been coaching for 16 years. Like me and them, 16 years. 
And I own all of the errors, all of the mistakes, all of the injuries. And as I have progressed as a coach over the 16 years, to see what those people can do is really profound right now. But I've actually seen their development. I've seen the inputs and the outputs from it and understood their life and understood their stress and understood all the injury histories and all those things. And, you know, um, you know, Ken Burns, the documentarian, um, has a sign in his office, which says, um, it's complicated, right? And it's okay that we, we recognize that it's complicated. You're coming from a different place. You grew up wearing, you know, you're part of some Swiss Alpine ski cults and you wore ski boots all the time. Okay, that's your, that's your background. Great, who are we today? But I think it's an opportunity for us all as coaches and teachers, and teachers really write, write the right word, um, you know, to, to be able to identify when something isn't working and not just go harder into the pain of, we just need more skills. We just need to go more, you need more repetition, more practice, but to become curious now and say, well, is this a fundamental error in your abilities to be able to do that shape or we progress too fast is this the fact that you just don't have any hip flexion that's why you can't backflip because you just can't tuck yeah. you know that's your problem bro you can't tuck you know um or do you you know do you have an injury history or are you just good old-fashioned weak rarely do i see weakness as the limiting factor right that is the number one thing that doctors and physical therapists like to tell people you're weak and i'm like really do you think someone's so weak like, I don't, I'm not buying it. You have to be so detrained. Weakness is rarely a problem. And conversely, what we told people for decades is just get stronger. Like, well, how strong do you need to be? I don't know. Stronger. You know? Like, what? How strong do I need to be? What am I doing? And there are really good coaches like Bondarchuk, who was an incredible track and field coach, who said early on, he's like, get out of the gym. You're done. You, you can bench press 500. Bench pressing 505 does not make you throw the implement more. What you need to do is go throw more and practice more. Not, but athletes like to show progress and be in the gym, you know, do things they're good at. It's really recursive because it's easy to see progression in this recursive nature. When you start a parkour experience or a movement experience for the first time, your mind is blown because you can't do it, don't know what it looks like, don't know what to expect, right? And the learning that happens is the same learning, by the way, when someone steps into a CrossFit gym for the first time, they're like, you can't swing a kettlebell or snatch a dumbbell or do pull-ups or burst, burst. The learning that goes on initially is part of the skill magic, right? It just blows up in people's faces around the fact that they aren't learned. But then we have to have, be ready for that next conversation. And what we've done, I think, is really skated by a long time on the fact that just being better was enough instead of saying, is this a complete practice? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, finding those minimums and in, in the full spectrum of them. Right. And then getting, stopping the minimum so that we can go do the thing. Yeah. And that thing, if that thing is mountain biking, well, I'm like, how do you define being a better mountain biker? As we said earlier, you know, how, how are you, you know, there are some things that I obsess on every day. I obsess on my balance every day. I'm on the slack line. I'm on the slack block. I'm all, like, I'm just always screwing around. Right. That's like a non-negotiable for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I have lots of pull-ups in my program, no matter what I spend more time overhead than you would think a gigantic man should be over overhead. Right. That just makes everything work really well for me. If I do lots and lots and lots and lots of pull-ups, not high volume, just lots of pull-ups. Right. I just, I'm always pulling and changing the things I pull on. Mm -hmm. Right. Is rich in environment. I like to deadlift. When I deadlift, everything connects, right? And some days I don't pick very heavy, you know? Some days it's just, I just deadlift a little bit, and, you know? And then I keep a huge set of lungs lying around because it turns out the second I got unfit, I was really crappy skiing, hiking, being unprepared. So it seemed like putting energy into that aerobic system made me a lot more capable, fun guy when it came time to go play and surf and do all those things. Then. I'm willing to negotiate the corners and the edges. And maybe it's too late for me because I'm 47. 47, but I don't know, man. You're making 47 look pretty good. I'm like, dude, <laughs> it's 47 now. I'm not as scared about being uh, 38. Um, uh, you know, you're still doing backflips, right? Well, right now, you know, I was going really fast on my skis. Oh, you're six talking years. about your knees. 
and I put my femur through my tibia and uh, I'm probably cruising towards a knee replacement, believe it or not. I have, it's bone on bone and deep flexion. So things like jumping right now, if you saw me play Frisbee, you'd be like, why is that guy landing on one leg? Right. And uh, I get a lot of strange input, which is really interesting and begets this next conversation because I'm like, how do I scale that? So if something I have lost my ability to express or play in your movement system because it doesn't account for um, disability. It doesn't count for injury. And you're like, well, I just don't know what to tell you. Well, I'm like, well, that's an incomplete answer, right? Because I'm still going to need to move through the environment. So there's one of the things we need to expand is this notion of social justice, right? What if I'm a 300 pound, 12 year old, can I still do this? Oh, you haven't accounted for that yet. Then there's still, still some holes in your program. So we're looking for inclusive natural capacities. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying pointing the, the finger at anyone. Like if you if you have a herniated disc, what does this look like now? If I've gotten into a car accident and I don't have any shoulder range, what does this look like now? So I, I it's really important for me in my thinking that I'm always looking at how does this scale and does it remain some variation of it across cohorts, right? And that doesn't mean just because like I have a, a hole in my knee, I still squat full squat. I don't, I mean, I can still get into school squat position i don't squat anymore but it turns out that has not been a limiting factor in any of my life skills what hurts is going 100 miles an hour on my skis right now yeah. go figure you know <laughs> so yeah i mean one of the interesting things about that for me is that as we've adopted a real self-organized oriented constraints led approach to practice it's allowed us to work with groups and f help athletes find solutions. That's right. Very different types of bodies, right? We have a, one of our regular students is recovering from a traumatic brain injury. And That's right. he could barely pick up one of his legs when he started with us. And he's come a tremendous way. And we have got a guy who's, you know, 150 pounds overweight and he's out there, you know, fighting. And that's what I say is the hallmark of a complete movement system. It in, is inclusive. Yep. It gives us waypoints right? To just be able to go up. You know, if I, if I do someone's program and it's three hours of muscle ups today and I can't do a muscle because I'm going to be wrist motion and I, then I don't know what to tell you. That's not, that's sort of incomplete. I mean, and let me apply that towards, you know, some of the, the language I've heard from elite strength coaches go run it. This is like Russian strength coach. What do you do for cardio? I run a hill. What if I don't have a hill? I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> go, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, so step one, you know, and as we, as we expand this conversation, we're going to have to ask more of ourselves as coaches in terms of being able to see that. And also in that nugget that you dropped there about problem solving, that's how I program all the time. I program a problem and then that's the hypothesis. And then we're going to explore you, your skill, your ability, your coordination towards that movement hypothesis. That's why it's not just do a bunch of work, right? Mm -hmm. That doesn't work anymore. No. And you know, work for a, work for a minute for people who weren't doing any work, right? <laughs> you water the plant with Gatorade, yeah. and for a second, the plant's like, yes, right? Yeah. So you know, I I think you really hit it on the head that you know we these things need to be really intellectually as play and rigorous as play and that can be throwing a frisbee around yep. you know i'm like i'm like dude maybe don't throw the medicine ball in this formal way there's really good value in throwing medicine balls and we believe in it but also you know bella caroli let his athletes play his male gymnasts play indoor soccer it seemed to warm them up really well yep. you know yeah there's okay there's what are the truths then what what is it about you know playing soccer for his gymnasts that allowed them to have this stimulus. Highly diverse movement. It's fun. It's engaging. It gets them in flow states. We So we started doing this game, or this thing where we just played ball games to warm up, right? So we play, uh, right. the classic one we call is, um, we call it uh, startup, the startup game. Because it's like a startup company where the balls are all going to fall on your head eventually. Um, so you have everyone in a group, in a circle, and they just pick a target and throw a tennis ball at them. You got like 60, you know, not 60, but you have like, a lot of tennis balls for the people. So there's not one ball, there's many balls. And you can start coordinating by calling out the name of the person that you're trying to get the ball to, right? So we'll do that. Then we'll do like three ball cascade juggling, but with two people. And then you find all these ways to vary and challenging each other with it. Or a game where you like have someone just try to catch three balls in a row that you throw into different places to stretch them out and force them to hit the ground and force them to go down. Um, and what we noticed about these games is they move you through wide ranges of motion, right? They give you a, a, they give you a window into lots of different 
vectors of force and body positions. Um, but they make you smile and they make you laugh. So you're sweating, right? Your body's been through all sorts of ranges of motion, but you're excited. And we said, okay, well, maybe a warm up shouldn't just be physiological. It should be neurological. It challenges your brain and emotional, right? You're warmed up to the, the experience. And I think this is what, what we're seeing with a lot of these people who bring in play some pickup soccer, play a, a game of pickup basketball before you do a, a weightlifting session, right? Uh, the guys, um, I'm trying to remember who was talking about this, but oh, Joel Smith from, uh, from Just Fly Performance, who's saying, if you talk to like vertical jump guys who come out of the basketball world, they never jump as high as after they played a game of pickup. There's something that gets turned on there. Yeah, it's weird, that arousal thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, you know, it really is, um, you know, as you were saying, sort of intimating earlier, you know, going outside and moving is, you know, Juliet, step up. Juliet and I believe that this, this notion of mobility is a, is a missing pillar of foundation of health. Yep. And one of the reasons is you can't move through the environment effortlessly, right? You just don't have enough range of motion and dorsiflexion, or you can't extend your hip, or you can't round your spine. Like, you are a liability to yourself in the environment, okay? So, you know, but part of the magic of going into the world and this play, this warm up, is this interaction, right? This, this, these transition times of being in a tribe. We're seeing it more and more right now how vital it is and how we're going against our human nature to sort of sequester ourselves, right? Anson Dorrance, who is maybe the greatest soccer coach, one of the greatest soccer coaches of all time for North Carolina you know, uh, UNC, women's soccer, basically invented women's soccer in the United States the way we know it. Um, you know, he always had like a five, you know, everything was scripted. They played for 90 minutes. That's how long his practice is. Super tight, everything scripted, ton of play, ton of goofing, but it's, all, it's very scripted. But one of the things he had was like, yeah, this like 10 minute run or five minute run they do. And he's like, I think we could use that time better. And it turned out he created really miserable soccer players because in that 10 minute warm up. They were talking, they were interacting, they were belonging, they were seeing each other, they were feeling what their bodies felt like. They were, you know, they were doing all of these things. It had nothing to do with training and nothing to do with warm up, but was 100% crucial to the success of the practice. And, and that is what we have done to our bodies. We have stripped out this, we sucked out the joy. And we haven't even left time for that, right? Because we were like, I got to get through this plyo program and then I've got to do this. Ex, uh, you know, auxiliary work, and then I've got to get my main lift in, and then I go do my gymnastics, and then I go do my cardio, and then I got to foam roll, and you know, and then I get my macros and late, and I'm just like hand you my spreadsheet, move on, and like what is that? Yeah, I mean, so now we're, we've got five minutes left for this interview, and I <laughs> feel like we just need to have another. But what I love is if anyone actually listens to this, I want them to appreciate that these are the conversations that happen between coaches yeah. that are really important. And I'm sure they've been going on for a long time. Mm -hmm. What is essential? What, how do we expand our thinking? What is it that that person's doing that's getting those great results and trying to understand process? Yeah. You will never see a master coach, master teacher in the web ever throwing shade at someone else. They'll just never do it. What you'll see is they will watch someone for a long time and then be like, mm, they don't understand or, there's a hole in the system or, you know, or those things I've just well, I've stolen from them, Rafe. Uh, you know, thanks, Rafe. You mm -hmm. just made me a better coach. But you'll never see someone disparage because the, the next level or the next step in this sort of problem solving that you were saying is for a coach to problem solve for group and problem solve for an individual. It's just an extension of, of understanding and feeling to watching and helping someone else feel. Yeah, I mean – so you said, uh, you know, the running, it wasn't doing anything training wise. When we think of the training as just the physiological level. That's right. When we recognize it as the emotional, the connection, the tribe, the meaning level. And this is what has really hit me through the long retreats that we do. It's like, and, and also through my own experience of, of kind of like breaking myself as an athlete in order to try to achieve certain things and then saying, well, I can keep breaking myself and maybe I'll come close to achieving my goals or maybe this thing is something I want to do for my life. And if it's something I want to do for my life, how do I orient myself around it? 
So that's the question around like movement as being about meaning, right? We, our movement practice is about what it connects us to and what it means for us. And you, you, you've alluded to this multiple times across this conversation, talking about tribe, talking about this thing. And I, uh, I think it'd be really good to, to, to pick this up another day, maybe a couple months down the line and, and have another conversation. Cause I think that there's a, I felt the tribe at your gym when I come to visit. And I think there's a lot of insight that people need because I think that so much of the conversation that we have in our industry, at least the conversation that you see publicly is on the level of the physiology. And we can't- Oh, how about this? I don't even know what's on the physiology. It's on the aesthetics. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> right? I think you're being really kind. I think people <laughs> use physiology to have a certain body outcome for, a, for an Instagram shot. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, I'm like, is that a body that is ready to go? You know, is that a body that's a liability or is that, man, I hope you found deep aesthetic satisfaction in that moment where you are shredded, you know, and you got all the external validation because guess what? Tomorrow's going to come, bro. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to be a hundred years old and you are eating like a, like a dog, you know, yeah. you're eating brown rice and broccoli and skinless sashimi chicken breasts. Like, gosh, shoot me in the face. <laughs> Raisin skins. <laughs> just the skin flesh <laughs> so um so yeah so you know hopefully everyone enjoyed this it was so good to have you on again i definitely want to go deeper into this conversation on meeting and i feel like there's just a lot more for us to talk about so uh until next time thank you kelly oh thank you and just let me tell you people Go be a beginner and jump into someone else's tribe community they'll welcome you in go in you know we mentioned why GSP is one of the greatest athletes in the world. He's open. I cannot recommend enough that you just, you know, traverse as many movement practices as you can. Cool. Thanks for listening to the Evolve Move Play podcast. If you want to support what we're doing, make sure to like, share, subscribe, and hit that notifications button so you know what's coming up. And of course, the biggest support you can give is to become a Patreon supporter. This is what's going to allow us to grow this platform more than anything else. So this is entirely listener supported, and we really appreciate your support. And we look forward to talking to you again soon.